<laughs> All right. Well, here we are, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, FFI, for supplying Zoom. And here we have Karen Miller of Zentankara. And Karen's going to talk about the benefits and how can um, Zentankara can uh, enhance your fly fishing. And then she's going to talk about a, a really cool program that I'm kind of thrilled about. So I can't wait for her to bring that up. So I am going to take the spotlight off of me and we are going to hear from Karen Miller. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I was very excited to, uh, to talk to everybody today because, um, you know, Tenkar is one of those things that a lot of people now uh, have heard about, but a lot of people still don't know anything about it. And um, it is a different way of fly fishing, um, but it is a way of fly fishing that actually can help your regular traditional rod and reel setup. So that's what we're gonna kind of talk about um, a little bit today. And then uh, at the end, um, I'm gonna share with you uh, uh, for a few minutes about uh, an organization that I'm kind of getting involved with just like by accident, but it keeps kind of coming around back to me. So it seems like it's uh, meant to be, so to speak. So um, just a kind of a quick show of hands. Um, you can just kind of wave in your in your uh, computer. You don't have to try and look for the, the hand waving thing, you know, on the on the menu. But how many of you are familiar and know what Tenkara is? Can you can you wave your hand if you know what it is? And all right, I'm just kind of scrolling so I can see people. Okay. All right. And so most of you looks like you have an idea what Tenkara is. How many of you actually have fished Tenkara or um, have a Tenkara rod and, and actually use it? Oh, couple, there, a few less. So not as many people. Okay. So a lot of people know what Tinkar is. They've heard about it. Um, what I find is a lot of people have Tinkar rods, but they never use them. Or like I, I have one, or I was given one, uh, but I've never used it. And I um, am going to encourage you uh, to pull your Tinkar rods or think about getting one and spending some time on it. So I'm going to go back and forth and kind of share a, a screen with you. Um, so if I abandon ship here for a few moments, don't panic, I'll be back. So let me share my screen. And we're going to go there. Come on. All right. So Tinkara and how it can improve your regular fly fishing. So we're going to talk about just, we're going to, I guess, hit on a couple of main questions. And the first one is, if I use a rod and reel, or if I plan on using a rod and reel, you know, why should I learn how to do Tankara? What is the benefit of that? The other one is, how, how does it help? Um, excuse me, my battery is running low. Which I don't understand. Ah. Emergency. Never quite happened. I've had it plugged in all day, so I apologize. Don't want to lose anybody. So there we go. We're all better. Okay. So how how does learning Tinkara actually help? with a rod and reel setup. And if it's such a great way to learn fly fishing and so beneficial, why didn't I hear about this? Why didn't somebody tell me about this years ago or when I started fly fishing? So whenever I talk about fly fishing, whether it is Tenkara or uh, 
rod and reel because just to make it perfectly clear to everybody here, I fish both methods. I use a rod and reel and I use a Tinkara rod and I really, really like being fluid in both methods. Um, I started out learning on a regular rod and reel, moved to Tinkara and then brought the rod and reel back in. So when I when I talk to people or work with people on learning to fly fish, whether it's Tinkara or regular rod and reel, I always refer to the Shrek movie. And I don't know if, uh, if you're familiar with the animated movie Shrek, but he's an ogre and there's a princess Fiona who is beautiful, but is really an ogre too. And then, you know, Eddie Murphy plays the donkey yada yada and there's a point in the movie where donkey and shrek are talking and they're they they're kind of becoming friends and donkey you know is kind of wondering well if you're an ogre how can you be sort of this nice guy and shrek responds by saying ogres are like onions they have layers well so does fly fishing fly fishing has layers and there's a lot to learn in each layer. So when I talk about fly fishing, I like to talk about the layers of fly fishing. And over time, I've boiled them down to six different layers. The first three are sort of the, the basis. You know, that's kind of, you're, you're halfway there if you get to the first three. And then the, the, the last three, numbers four, five, and six, are, are really where, you know, it takes a long time to get those skills. And it's something that you're kind of working on for a long time. And um, it kind of gets into, um, you know, it, th those last three can become more important. Um, and more critical or more complicated as you start to explore more aggressive species or, you know, uh, more, um, more technical or difficult fishing. So the very first uh, layer is where do fish live, right? To be a great angler, you kind of have to know where fish live. Um, when I started fishing, I thought they were everywhere in the river and they're not everywhere. So you don't have to become a fish biologist and, you know, you don't need to take, uh, you know, college courses on, you know, um, on fish habitat, but you have to have a general, uh, understanding of the places that fish like to hang out you know, uh, behind rocks and streams, you know, uh, if the water is running fast, they may hide the, ba the bank because it doesn't take as much energy for them to hold their place. Um, so having just that basic understanding uh, before you ever pick up a fly rod is really helpful, okay? Because you can be the best caster in the world, but if you're not casting in the right spot and there are no fish there, you're never going to catch a fish. Okay. Number two, casting, the second layer, is where I think, you know, most people kind of, like, they struggle there. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, motions to learn. There's a lot of muscle memory to learn. And, you know, within Within the uh, layer of casting, there's all these other layers. There's all these different kinds of casts, um, hauling and double hauling and, um, you know, casting backwards and uh, roll casts and spay casting and all these other things. So you can spend a lot of time learning how to cast, but it's, in, it's important because if you can't get your line to where the fish are hanging out, right? You're never gonna catch a fish. So you need to know where fish like to hang out and you need to be able to get your line to where they are. 
The third layer, and if you kind of get this down, you're, you're sort of on uh, what I call, you're at the midpoint, fly patterns and presentation. It, that's a big chunk of information. You can kind of fall down a rabbit hole um, when it comes to fly patterns and presentations. Um, but if you know where fish live and you can get your line to them, then the next thing that you really have to start working on is choosing a fly uh, pattern and offering it up to that fish in a way that is going to make them want to strike at it, okay? Because if you're serving something that they're not interested in, no matter how good a caster you are, they're not going to take it, right? And you have to be able to lay it down in the water in a way that is going to initiate a strike, make them move and exert the energy it takes to take your fly. So if you can do those three things, you are really doing well, okay? You are, you're, you're halfway there. You're finding fish, you're getting the line to them, and you're getting them to strike. That right there is half the battle. Then we get into setting the hook, okay? And setting the hook can can be something that people struggle with for a long time. In fact, really excellent anger, anglers um, that have been fly fishing for years still flub the, the hook set. Um, and part of it is being able I, to identify when a fish is really striking your hook and nibbling at that fly, being able to understand what that feels like. Um, and then the then being able to respond with a, a motion, a muscle movement, whether it's a strip set, whether it's moving the rod, or whether it's an, uh, an upward motion of the rod, right? So once you get the, the fish to go after your fly, then you have to be able to set the hook. And a lot of that takes tremendous practice because it is muscle memory and it is a uh, quick muscle reflex. And it takes a while to teach your body to do that, okay? After you actually work on that hook set, right? And you set the hook, then you've got to stay connected to the fish. And that's what I call onion layer number five. Um, I, a couple weeks ago, was uh, working with someone who is brand new to fly fishing, and she was great at casting the fly, um, she was presenting it well, fish were going after Uh-oh. Um, I think everybody's here. Karen, you dropped out momentarily. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay. Um, so um, I'll just go back in case you lost me. So uh, th this person missed 20 or 30 hook sets. You know, she was getting multiple opportunities. And she missed it, missed it, missed it, you know, until I started standing next to her and hitting her in the arm, set the hook, set the hook, set the hook, you know, uh, and cueing her. Um, by, the, by the afternoon, she started to recognize what that, what that feeling was, and she actually was setting the hook. The problem was she wasn't staying connected to the fish. So she'd have the fish on, she'd be like, I got a fish, I got a fish. And the next thing you know, the fish would throw the hook. So staying connected and actually learning to manage and play that fish is a huge part. And as you progress in your fishing and you're not just landing, you know, little uh, brook trout that can kind of be muscled in, 
you know, that play and that fish management and being able to control the situation becomes more critical. The final and last layer of fly fishing is, is actually landing the fish. It's, it, it ends with a successful landing, knowing when that fish is ready to come in and making that move to land them and get them in the net. So fly fishing is, I mean, it's more than a mouthful. It's more than a plateful to learn. And trying to do all those things at one time in addition to manage line and work a reel and, you know, um, start to learn all those cues is, can be overwhelming. And that's why so many people um, start fly fishing and never really continue down their path because it's described as being complicated or too hard or really complex or I don't have the time to learn because it is seen as a sport that is complicated. So Tenkara simplifies those things. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Okay. Oh, I must have popped out when... Uh, Oops, apologize. Well, yeah, I think when I lost that connection, I... All right. So, why is this not letting me do this? Sorry. Ah. Uh... It's not letting me share my screen. There we go. All right. So when I when I compare Tenkara to regular fly fishing, I I like to use uh, the latex glove versus the winter mitten analogy. Um, Tenkara is simply more sensitive, more flexible, ultra light and it delivers more tactile feedback. Um, why is that important? Well, if you were going into surgery uh, and your surgeon said, uh, you know, I can use this oven mitt during surgery, or I can use this really thin, you know, latex glove, assuming you're not allergic to latex, um, you know, which would you rather have? You're gonna say, I want you to use, you know, the, the latex glove, not the mitten, because you don't have as much flexibility. You don't have as much control. It isn't as nimble. Tenkara rods are ultra, ultra light carbon fiber, uh, long rods. Okay. They're hollow and each section nests inside the neck, the, the necks when it collapses. But these carbon fiber hollow tubes deliver such feedback to you that the experience and the sensations are heightened. Why is that important? Well, when you're learning to fly fish, you know, um, for instance, casting, you know, layer number two. Casting is a tactile experience. It's a tactile skill. It's, it, it is a physical motion and you, and it has to do with timing and when the rod loads, fully loads. And you feel that in your hand and that sensation that goes into your hand tells you it's time to move my arm forward, okay? So you learn how to cast by that tactile feedback and you learn the timing and how to load the rod by, by the information that you're getting into your hand and into your arm, okay? On a regular rod and reel, Rods are heavier, they're solid, and they don't flex as much. So the feedback that they're delivering to you, the angler, 
is dampened, it's less, okay? So it's harder to learn that timing on a regular rod and reel setup, simply because you're just not getting as much information, okay? And when you get that information, it's more sublime, uh, it's more discreet. So you have to really pay attention to feel when that rod is fully loaded, okay? Is no different than um, a hook set on a regular rod and reel. Um, that hook set is often very, very difficult to feel. You know, um, I remember when I was learning to fly fish and, you know, I, I would be like, was that a fish? Was that a fish? Was that a fish? Oh, I think that was the bottom. Did I get snagged on something? And over and over again, it was a fish taking my fly, but I wasn't responding because I hadn't learned what that feedback felt like. Um, and it was harder to learn on a regular rod and reel because it wasn't as pronounced. Since ten, ten car rods um, are, are so sensitive, even the smallest nibble is, is really felt in your hand. And the fact that the line attaches directly to the tip of the rod also helps make that message come across clearer, okay? On a rod and reel, you have all this line uh, that comes down the length of your rod through, uh, through guides and then wraps around your reel. And so, you know, even if you have your finger on the line, it, it's, it's much more difficult to, to feel a hit and to know when you need to set the hook. On a tenkar rod, because you don't have any extra line, and that that line is tied directly to the end of your tenkar rod, the minute the fish takes even the smallest nibble, that rod tip flexes. It, I mean, the you know, it runs right up that line to the tip of your rod. You not only see the rod, but you feel it. It goes straight down that ultralight, ultra sensitive carbon fiber tube and into your hand. And because there's no slack in the line, it takes a very small movement for you to set the hook. Now, what happens is you end up experiencing greater success faster on a Tenkara rod. It actually speeds up the learning curve because the feedback that you're getting for lack of a better way of explaining it, it it's like in your face, you know? It, it's if I want to get somebody's attention, I can, you know, very, very gently maybe tap their ponytail or touch their hair and, and they may feel it or they may just kind of be like, what was that? Um, but if you bonk somebody on the head, right, you get their attention right away. It's, 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 a, it's a more dramatic response. It's like, ah, I know somebody's, you know, somebody's trying to get my attention. And it's the same thing with the Tenkara rod. So what that means is because you get an opportunity to be successful faster because you're getting more cues, right? You're getting more feedback. So you're learning what those cues are and you're identifying them quicker and you're becoming more familiar with them. And because you're more familiar with them, you're actually having more success and you're getting more practice, which makes you a better angler regardless. So let me go back to the screen. So inevitably you end up improving. And when you transfer those skills to a rod and reel setup, you know what you're going to feel even though those, that feedback 
baby more discreet, your response time is quicker, your muscle reflexes are faster, and you identify those sensations and that feedback quicker. So you end up transferring into a rod and reel faster. When I, um, when I was uh, doing regular fly fishing, um, you know, and I started, uh, well, before I started Tenkara, I was casting, you know, about 30 feet, 40 feet, maybe on a really good day if the wind was behind me. Um, and I caught fish and I was, you know, I was okay. Um, but when I started doing Tenkara, I actually stopped using my rod and reel for, um, you know, about a year and became really proficient with Tenkara and actually started fishing more uh, for one thing because I was more successful. And, you know, when you're catching lots of fish and being successful at something, you just tend to do it more. Um, the setup was faster. So I could get out on the river, you know, uh, quicker and I didn't have to dedicate so much time. You know, if I had a little bit of time, I could squeeze in some fishing with a 10 car rod because it took just, you know, barely five minutes to set it up and break it down. Um, but after, after about a year, I decided to go back to my rod and reel and I picked up my rod and reel for the first time. I hadn't touched it in little over a year. And my first cast was over 60 feet. Not because I was ever having to cast 60 feet on a rod, uh, on a Tenkara rod. You know, most of my casts were 15 feet on a Tenkara rod. But I understood the timing of my regular rod and reel better and I could feel it. And I knew how to cast just because I understood what I was looking for. I understood the timing better and the cue to move my arm in an opposite direction was there in my head. And I recognized it immediately on a rod that I hadn't touched in a year. And certainly, you know, on my best day, couldn't have made that cast um, a year earlier. So using Tenkara will help you build skills that will transfer into a regular rod and reel setup and make you a more proficient angler on your reel. So the, the question is, you know, if this is such a great method and a good way to learn, you know, why didn't anybody tell me about this? You know, when I went into a fly shop, why didn't anybody show me a Tenkara rod? Why doesn't anybody, you know, you know why do no guides, you know, uh, suggest a Tenkara rod? And, you know, it's a, it's a few simple answers. Um, and one of them is that it's new. Tenkara is a method that is very old and been around for many, many years. In fact, you know, all different uh, cultures have some version of a fixed line fly rod. Um, but here in the United States, you know, Tenkara, the Japanese method is, is new. It's only been here since about 2009, 2010. And fly fisher men who are still, you know, the, the dominant force in the fly fishing industry are still themselves learning about it. Um, I can walk into um, a fly shop and pretty much guarantee there will be, you know, if there are five staff members or three staff members, maybe one of them has any experience with fly fishing. A few years ago, you walked in and 
the majority of staff at a fly fishing shop did not know what Tenkara was, or they knew what it was, but they had never done it. You know, they had read about it. Maybe they had seen somebody do it, but they had no personal experience. So they're not going to tell you about something that they really don't know about or that they're not confident about. The other part of that is that the fly fishing industry is very resistant to change, to new things. It's, uh, it's an industry that is steeped in, you know, tradition. It, fly fishing was always considered sort of a gentleman's sport. You know, it was a sport that uh, was reserved for, you know, wealthy white um, men. Right. And um, and fly fishing um, was not accessible to everybody. And it was even considered, you know, almost like an art form. And so anytime, it, it, you know, there's a lot of tradition around anytime there's anything new in uh, fly fishing, the industry as a whole sort of like, Ugh, you know, you're talking about something that that. Um, you know, is, has a, a lot of, um, I don't know uh, what the word is, you know, glory and tradition surrounding the sport. And um, it's also a sport that is dominated by men who don't take this wrong, <laughs> any of you men out there, but, you know, often can be a little resistance to change, you know, they're doing something, it works, why change it? It's, simple as that. Um, but Tenkara really makes fly fishing much more accessible to um, a, a broader scale because uh, it is less complicated. It requires less, less uh, gear um, and is ultimately uh, less expensive to get into. The last reason, <laughs> which is kind of um, part of the, uh, the, uh, the previous reasons is that women on whole are playing catch up in the fly fishing industry. We are generally, our knowledge base is, you know, is playing catch up um, because we um, have recently just entered uh, the fly fishing world. And so we're going, we're not going to hear about it as soon as, you know, some of the other guys, because we're just learning about other things that are more, you know, that have been around longer. And um, certainly, you know, fly shop owners and guides and outfitters um, have more experience with and are more comfortable talking. About. So that's part of the reason why um, when a newbie walks into a fly shop um, and says, you know, I'm thinking about getting involved in fly fishing and I want to learn, it's very rare that, um, you know, a, a, a fly shop staffer or owner will suggest a 10 car rod, even though it makes more sense. And I will say that most anglers that begin with Tenkara do at some point transition into a rod and reel. It doesn't mean they give up their Tenkara rod. It just means they add another method to their quiver, another rod to their quiver. And they usually become much more fluid and um, a much more proficient angle uh, angler. Um, and it's simply because Tenkara does have limitations, uh, not as many as most people think, but it does have limitations. And there is a point that, you know, you're going to want to, you know, cast uh, a long cast or you need a reel in certain situations. And so a natural progression is going into a Tenkara rod anyways. So nobody, you know, should be fearful that if they do Tenkara or learn on Tenkara, that they're ever, you know, going to be stuck in Tenkara. They will always end up uh, learning a rod and reel in addition. So, Tenkara. Why 
is it beneficial, even if you're a rod and reel angler learning it, simply because you're getting more feedback. You're going to be relying on skills versus relying on your reel, okay? On a Tenkara rod, once you connect that fish, you have to play that fish the entire time. So you're building uh, foundational skill sets and some of the ones that are more difficult to learn, um, like fish management and staying connected to the fish. Um, and because you're getting more feedback and it's easier to learn those skills because you're getting more information, you have more success. When you have more success, you end up doing it more just naturally. And when you do something more, in essence, you're practicing that. And by practicing it, you end up improving it. And all of that translates into a solid, transferable, foundational skills that move into a rod and reel. So Tenkara is more straightforward. It's less complicated. It's more obvious. The feedback is more dramatic. So it's easier to learn those cues and identify the feedback that you're getting from the fish. It relies on very, very foundational rudimentary fishing skills that can be used on a rod and reel and that are used routinely on a rod and reel setup, but you don't notice them as much. They're more discreet. And what I like to say is it's less expensive to get into. So um, having a Tenkara rod is not a huge um, investment for what you're getting out of it as far as learning and skill set. So before we move on to Fish for Change, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Do you find guides particularly thrilled? Um, not Well, maybe not you because they know what they're getting, but um, have you gotten any feedback from folks like that are, have just gone out, say a guide in Montana, and they go, I want to fish Tenkara? It, it's changing. So, you know, what, what, is, what I'm finding is, um, you know, for instance, uh, up in Alaska at Rapids Camp Lodge, um, they now have, uh, they're a Tenkara friendly lodge. Every one of their guides carries a Tenkara rod oh with them now. And what they find is um, that many times people, you know, even people that go on incredible trips aren't always great at casting and, um, or, you know, they, they, or somebody that maybe isn't as experienced is, is struggling. And instead of that guide trip going south and somebody getting frustrated and not landing fish or, you know, being disappointed, they just simply say, hey, let, why don't you try this? Now, we also have anglers here in Colorado, I'm sorry, guys, that will do the same thing. You know, they'll have people that come out, um, you know, especially a lot of tourists that come to the area and they, they don't really have any experience, but they're like, I'm in Colorado, so I want to go fly fishing. Um, and they, you know, after an hour, they're, they're getting frustrated and there's, you know, um, there's, uh, you know, the guide is like, ah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm trying to make this guy happy and it's not working. So several guides will put them into tin car rods. So I was just up on the reef up in um, Wyoming a couple weeks ago, uh, two weeks. And it's funny because I had booked a trip and the only thing I said was um, one person in, in the party will be doing tin 
And I ended up with a guy that I have fished with uh, actually years ago. And he shared with me that in the shop, everybody was like, no way, no way. Like, I don't want the tin car person. You take them. No, you take them. Like nobody wanted the tin car rod on their float boat. So he's like, I'll do it. So we went and in this group of eight boats, okay, we were the last boat to take off from the shore. So what that means is eight boats with two anglers in it fish this water. They all floated this section, right? One after another. A couple people landed fish, a couple people didn't. We went out and in that same stretch, I landed three fish on my Tenkara rod. And we proceeded down the river, you know, on how you do with floats, you, you leapfrog, right? You know, and you go back down your, your, your little sections. Um, and an hour, two hours in, all the other boats were being outfished by the Tenkara rod. Not because I was doing anything spectacular, but because the tool was just effective. And, you know, it was funny because at midday, people, all the boats and the guides were just like, wow, oh my God, like, that's crazy. I can't believe it. You are slaying it. You, you know, you're just eating this up. And I outfished all the boats by the end of the day. And, and the guides and the people walked up to me at the, you know, at the end when we were back at the lodge and we're just like, holy schmoly. Like I have a totally new outlook on Tenkara. I, I like, it blew my mind. I never thought that, you know, that, 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 that could happen. You could do that on Tenkara. So, um, so it's definitely growing. And, um, you know, I had a couple of guides walk up to me at some of the fly fishing shows who, who came up and said, you don't know me, but I owe you an apology. And I was like, you know, why? And here's my little bleep. If you want to bleep me, he was like, I was an asshole to you. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> bleep. <"What?" laughs> bleep. Um, and he was like, you know, several years ago, I beat you up on Facebook and I've been bad mouthing Tenkara and, you know, thought it was stupid and for dummies and people who couldn't cast. But I got to tell you, I have so much respect for Tenkara now. And, you know, I, I'm going to get a rod and I'm going to learn it because if I don't, I, I, I know I'm behind times. And so that was really amazing confirmation so it's changing but again it's it's an industry that's slow to change i mean look at euro nymphing uh, a few years back you know euro nymphing was like oh that's different you know whoa and there were so many people who were against euro nymphing took a while and now it's accepted and it's no big deal so it, it like i said it's it's getting there and it has its place and it's just an incredible learning tool. So, um, you know, even if you just spend one year on Tenkara or one summer, I guarantee you it will improve your rod and reel fly fishing. So. Thank you. Yeah. Question. How big of a fish can you catch with a Tenkara rod? <laughs> Well, just before this, um, we started this meeting, I, um, it was just Corey and I, and she, I was on just kind of waiting and she, I had gotten an email and I was, um, almost jumping out of my skin, um, because she was of levitating. <laughs> <laughs> a customer had sent me a photo uh so you know not all 10 car rods are created equally so for instance with with my uh company with zen Tenkara, we have six different rods 
of, from a, what we call a three weight fly rod up to an eight weight fly rod. So, you know, you would, you wouldn't use a three weight fly rod to, to land a bone fish, but um, you know, when you say the biggest fish was probably an 18 pound chum salmon um, for poundage. Uh, the gentleman uh, that sent me an email today and that photo is gonna go up on Facebook and Instagram tomorrow, if I can contain myself, was um, a It'll be up tonight. golden Dorado that he had landed, um, you know, a big golden Dorado. So I routinely bonefish on Tinkara. Um, I've landed Junior Permit, Jack Trevelli, um, Bluefins. Um, I go to Alaska and do grayling and uh rainbows and uh, big browns in Patagonia. Um, we do chum salmon, sockeye, king salmon, um, barracuda, carp. I love carp fishing on Tenkara. Mm -hmm. So um, bigger than what you think. Um, it just depends on, you know, the rod and setup that you, you use. But uh, certainly, you know, the most traditional way of fishing Tenkara, where what it what it's known for is um, you know our small streams where you know the, the stream is no more than you know 30 feet across 20 feet across and you're fishing pools and pockets you know that's where oh, it's just you know it's just so beautiful yeah. and elegant and, and, and we have a lot of that here um, we have a couple of questions popping up on chat. One okay. kind of relates to what you were just talking about. How do you handle and land a big fish that wants to run? That's from George Gush. Okay. Well, my goodness, this is a whole presentation in and of itself. And it's something um, that I refer to as fish geometry. Okay. And um I, I do, I have done an entire presentation on it. And oh, it's, isn't it's, that on your website? It is. It's not, I have to redo it because it's not, that I didn't do a great job, yeah. but um, I, I, it's on my list of things to do to, to just kind of do a better job at presenting it. But um, that's, that's level, you know, number five on the onion layer where I talk about, you know, playing a fish and um, understanding fish management. And it's so important to understand whether it's a tankara rod or a rod and reel, um, because it, it's applicable in both situations. And I'll draw you, because I am a teacher. I have a whiteboard really quickly. So I'm gonna show you this because I can't resist. Geometry um, lessons, here we go. I, lo I love talking about fish geometry. So <laughs> let's see if I can do this. So, that, so this is the short version, the really quick version. If this is the, the angler, okay? Can you, can you see that? That's the yep. angler. And through. the fish is out here, okay? And your rod is in your hand somewhere up here. And then you have a line that runs to your fish, right? This creates three points. Point one, the angler. Point two, the fish. And point three, the tip of your rod. So the... Bigger that this angle is, if you think of this as a triangle, okay, if you're at about a 90 degree angle, you have a lot of control over the fish, okay? And the idea is that you want to keep tension on the fish. You don't want to rip lift, but you need to keep constant tension or pressure, okay, to have control. If anything goes slack, right, then you have a wild fish going wherever. So on a Tenkara rod, if I stay 
from about 135 degrees to about, I even like to say on a big fish, 65 degrees. If my rod can stay in this area, I have control over the fish, okay? And I'm steering and turning the fish, using the fish's momentum. He runs one way, I'm gonna bring him back the other, but never sacrificing that angle. Always maintaining what we call the power curve in Tenkara. The minute my rod starts to go past about 65 degrees and lays out straight, game over, I am screwed, okay? <laughs> unless, unless you can run fast and regain that curve by catching up to the fish and pulling your rod tip, your rod back. So you're moving forward as you're bringing the rod back to reestablish that open angle. Because once this, my rod tip comes down, I can't recover because I don't have a reel, okay? On a rod and reel, when a fish runs, you put the rod tip down and you let him take line and run until he gets a little tired and pauses. And that's your cue when you feel that pause to start reeling them in. And as you reel in, what do you do? You start to bring your rod tip back up and you're back in control. So this is what I refer to as fish geometry. On the opposite end, on a Tenkara rod, if I bring this rod back past about a 135 degree angle, right? Because 180 would be laying flat. My rod is going to break or I'm going to have no control over the fish because what happens is instead of having a rod that curves like that, where if this is the handle, I have even distribution of my load and the rod becomes extremely strong and powerful. I end up having a rod like this, like a candy cane. And what happens is I lose all my backbone because I'm not engaging the lower part of the rod and I'm putting all the pressure in the top sections. And the top sections are the most flexible sections on a 10 car rod, the softest section. So I'm going to have no control to steer the fish if my rod starts to lay back too far because I'm creating, I'm putting it into this position versus that position. Does that make sense? It does to me. And this, that might relate to another question we have here. Okay. Is it really easy to break off the tip of a Tenkara rod? Well, so yes and no. Um, so you can take the tip of a Tenkara rod, which is very flexible, and it bends. And if I wanted to, I could just take this and snap it in half right here. No problem, okay? But the idea is just like that, that candy cane picture or that letter J, you want to avoid putting all the pressure up in that top, sec top section. So when you start, when you're landing little fish, it's not such a big a big deal. You know, an eight inch brook trout can easily just be dragged across, you know, a stream. Um, an 18 inch brook trout is gonna fight and you need to spread that load deeper into the rod where you have more control. And you, you get to a point where you know, you become familiar enough with the rod, 
you know, and how it flexes that profile of where that, where that bend is. And, you know, I immediately go into that, what we call the power curve. I, I know where that is on the rod. I'm familiar with it. But as you, as you, as you fish, you, you know, you learn your own rod, you learn the tool and it becomes familiar with you. So, um, so it is, they're fragile. It's easy. More people break the rod collapsing it than they do on when actually fishing it. So people will break their tips by when they're putting it away by holding it up here and trying to push it down rather than holding it by the joints and collapsing it. But it seems like it's not any more fragile than any other fly rod. I mean, you mishandle a regular fly rod, it's gonna break. It's gonna break, yep. Did that just two weeks ago. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Ran over my Winston. Snap. Oh, no. That's okay. Did you, did you cry just a little bit? <laughs> just, just a little bit. A little bit. Um, so, so yeah, so they're not, um, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty durable. Um, I haven't broken, whenever I travel to destinations and I chase some of these big species, I always bring extra tips with me just in case. Um, and it's very rare that I break a tip. Very, very rare. I mean, I, I bring them along, um, but you know, I haven't broken a tip in, I don't know, maybe a year. So any other questions? I wanna be able to talk about fish for change. Yeah. We should you know, probably we'll take uh, a few moments. just speak a little bit on that. Let's roll into that now. Okay. All right. So very, very quickly, um, because it's just such a cool organization. Um, as I said, I, I am sort of serendipitously getting involved in Fish for Change. Um, I heard about it when I was in Honduras, in Guanaja, um, and um the lodge manager was talking about this program and he happened to mention that they were also starting a program in Costa Rica and he mentioned a name and I'm like, oh, I know Tom Ederlin, I fish with him. And he's starting a Tenkara program down in, um, in Costa Rica. And then I was heading to Mexico to fish for tarpon and lo and behold, um, Campeche Tarpon is also part of Fish for Change. And so I'm like, no way, you're part of Fish for Change. You know, I was just in Honduras and they're part of Fish for Change. So I was like, I need to find out what this is. And um, when I learned a little bit more about it, I decided I really um, think it's just an unbelievable program. Um, and I really... Um, want to be involved and uh, Zen Tenkara is getting involved um, and has just uh, donated a bunch of uh, rods and uh, gear and lines and stuff uh, to, um, to the Costa Rica uh, program. So the idea or mission behind it is that um, Using fly fishing as a platform, um, we can make the world a better place by uniting diverse groups of students in wild fisheries around the world and creating a generation of people who care about each other and who care about the environment. And so they're essentially creating philanthropists. Um, it all kind of started when um, the founder, uh, Steve um, Calloway Brown, uh, who actually lives in Colorado as well, um, was guiding. He is, he, he's been a, a guide for a, a very long time and fished in all different places. And um, he had a lot of clients that were very wealthy. Okay, a lot of people that fish around the world have a lot of money. And um, 
he started thinking about the places that that he fished with these clients and how poor they were and often uh, faced, um, you know, enormous economic hardship and um, as well as, you know, uh, just health issues and, you know, problems with sustaining um, their their economy um, and and also the environment and um, that they didn't under they didn't always uh, they weren't very educated often about the environment um, and how to maintain it um, in a as, so that it continued to be a fishery and so he had one particular client um, that when they traveled down to Honduras. Um, and he started teaching him about the community and he spent time in the community and created relationships with the guides and the guides families realized that they were in of, um, of better medical care. And so he actually funded a um, clinic uh, slash hospital in the area. Um, that's, you know, one very extreme version of donation. But in 1998, um, Guanaja was hit by Hurricane Mitch, and a one uh, portion of the island uh, was completely devastated because the hurricane sat on top of the island for four straight days. And it was essentially, I mean, there was nothing left of it. And so Steve had this idea of bringing people down because it was an incredible fishery um, and having them learn about the area and bring money into the area and eventually started um, to create a program uh, for kids to come down. Usually they were children of um, wealthier clients uh, that wanted to share fly fishing, the experience of fly fishing with their children and wanted them to learn, you know, this sport um, and be able to share it with them. And, um, but, you know, it needs to be there uh, for the next generation. It needs to be there to share. So um, Steve, uh, with a group of other people, uh, started this nonprofit program where they take in students and into these amazing fisheries, these amazing destinations, and the anglers learn about the community and the environment. Um, they learn about fly fishing, but they also learn what it takes to sustain uh, the fishery. Um, so they become intimately involved about uh, caring about that place. And they pair these kids uh, with uh, local kids uh, in order to share the cultural experience and um, create relationships that are hopefully become lifelong friendships. Um, in doing this, they also teach the kids, the local students about fly fishing because in most of these places that we fly fish, the local people other than a handful of guides do not fly fish. And in many, uh, many uh, of these destinations, uh, the guides are from somewhere else and they, you know, they come to these pristine, incredible fisheries um, to guide but they're not always residents of the area. Um, so through Fish for Change, um, students explore, learn, and work with indigenous cultures. And they address and collaborate both uh, on global and local initiatives that impact the people and the environment. So some of the things that the, um, Fish for Change has done, some of the initiatives that they're involved in, in mangrove restoration uh, in order to preserve uh, fisheries. And uh, in Guanaja, they have planted over a million 
mangrove seedlings. Um, and they collect uh, trash, uh, plastic containers that wash up on shore um, and litter the shore. And they use these plastic containers uh, to start the seedlings. So they go around and they collect the seeds off the mangroves and then they plant them in, um, you know, the, the garbage that gets washed up, these plastic containers, and then eventually transplant them build new mangrove forests. Uh, they work on eradic uh, eradication of invasive species, um, recycled art murals to beautify towns and cities, uh, local areas, churches, the school, uh, sustainable gardening. Uh, they get involved in fish tagging and research and actually teaching English in schools um, and also teaching about fly fishing. So through this whole process, they're working with local students um, and uh, the guides, sometimes staying in students' homes or the students are coming to the, students are also staying in the lodge and they're creating um, relationships um, and an understanding of the community. And when you, when you make friends, you care about, care about them and the places that they live. So the, the idea is that they're also offering uh, bright futures to many of the local, uh, local youth because in a lot of these locations such as the Bahamas or you know, a small island on Honduras, you know, the employment options are pretty limited. Um, economy is very limited and often you know, what is available are less um, <laughs> less uh, desirable uh, ways of making money. Um, and in some of these islands, it ends up being running drugs or getting involved in drugs or crime. And so um, by connecting with local students, um, they're participating in teaching the kids not only English, but also they're passing on their passion for fly fishing and teaching their skills and their knowledge about it, along with the guides and the educators. But they're, they're showing students, wow, this is a passion. This is, um, you know, this is um, a skill set that is admired and um, can, can create a career for you. So it allows them to learn about fly fishing and hopefully build, build on a skill set um, and in their later years become, become a guide or an apprentice guide, which in many of these locations is a very lucrative career. Um, they are often very well respected in the community. They're the top earners um, and you know the money that they earn uh, helps support and stimulate and add wealth, stabilize these local economies. So the impact is a trickle down uh, impact. And um, fish fishing is just doing such an incredible job. Um, so um, the idea is that they are, you know engaging that children, youth are engaging in service oriented fly fishing programs around the world in order to, you know, protect those places and protect the communities um, that are in those places and help their economies, help the people that, uh, that live there. So they currently have programs in Honduras Mexico, the Bahamas, Costa Rica, and a local program in Colorado. So uh, if you would like to get involved or learn more, please go to the website. If you would like to donate or, you know, somehow get involved by volunteering, um, there's tons of opportunities and, um, you know, if it's a if it's a fiscal donation, um, any 
amount is uh, always appreciated at any nonprofit. Um, if it's time, uh, fly fishing gear, any of those things, um, please reach out to them. Uh, Steve uh, Brown is just a wonderful guy, very down to earth and um, it's a great organization. So that is my experience with Fish for Change and we're very excited to be a part of the Costa Rica um, program that'll happen uh, this summer. And um, as I said, we sent down um, uh, seven or 10 rods, lines, all kinds of accessories and gear and uh, they'll be um, they'll be hosting students this summer. Well, thank you, Karen. That was wonderful. So on that note, I am going to stop recording and